Yeah, thanks, Craig. And just confirming you can see everything? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, thanks for uh, having me speak and uh, update everyone on some of our eDNA work. This work is in conjunction with some funding from the New York State Department of Transportation. And um, I'm going to sort of have three parts to this. One is just an overview of, of really the task in front of us in terms of stopping the spread and an early detection of spotted lanternfly and then where eDNA fits in there. And then I'll talk about um, a project that we're doing with, with the Department of Transportation to, to kind of map, map out the risk of um, establishment along major roadways. And the results, at least from this first fall, um, some takeaways from those first fall results. And then, and then a little bit just sort of seed out. There's another, we'll have a follow-up discussion on eDNA and spotted lantern fire. So I'll, I'll have a, just finish off with a few quick, quick pointers on that as well. So I've started calling this approach. We actually were using this sort of approach and I'm thinking about it more in terms of eDNA with use of in the context of several different invasive species because we also work in aquatic invasive species and using eDNA. And that's kind of the map it, find it, stop it um, continuum. So this is the invasion curve. I'm sure you've all seen this going from the point of introduction. So this could be just the initial introduction say to North America or to another continent, but it also can be considered at a very local scale. So at any one location, what does that invasion curve look like? So it's the initial introduction of an individual of that species to that location. Um, the population, if it's gonna establish, will start to grow usually a little bit at first following just standard population dynamics and then higher and higher until hopefully it eventually hits a local carrying capacity. Um, <clears throat> and then the main thing that gets overlaid onto this is the cumulative cost, the cumulative impact, and something that's also related here, sort of your chance of eradicating or stopping any kind of spread or that local population may be eradicating it. So the idea, this is from a recent paper out of biological invasions is that they can sort of, uh, for any particular invader, they can pick out what they call the runaway spread, runaway cost point. And that's where the population is large enough that really beyond that point, you can't stop it and the costs of stopping it will go up quite a lot. So the goal, of course, in invasive species management and in pest insect management is to never hit the runaway uh, spread and cost point, especially when, and if you want to stop the spread, you want to do that at every location where it shows up. The key, uh, the key in terms of eDNA um, and some things I'll talk about today is that detection point. So the authors here just put the detection point well below the, that point of runaway spread or runaway cost, but that, of course, varies by species and by habitat and everything else. So um, this is the worst case scenario, and that's that you don't detect it until you're past the point of runaway spread or runaway cost. That's sort of the worst case scenario. And I would say, uh, unfortunately, I think we're probably often in that situation with invasive species, um, but we don't really know how often we're in that space, but I, I kind of worry that we're regularly there. Um, but in the, in the best case scenario, you're taking whatever the detection is based on maybe any kind of tool that you have at hand and you're looking for any other kind of tool or any kind of mechanism to move that detection as close to the introduction point as possible. So if you do that, then you allow yourself a lot of time to um, respond, perhaps allow an eradication to be successful, but at to the very least, to be able to stop the spread from that location to any other. Uh, certainly if it is manageable, you minimize your costs as well. So anything really we can do in invasive species management to move that detection point way, way, way closer to the point of introduction is a massive help. I would say for spotted lanternfly actually listening to Julie's updates this morning is that um, that's possibly one of the reasons that that we're having such trouble with the uh, um, with those satellite populations, and then you see these sort of massive spread jumps, is if those individuals can move in their gravity or, or functionally gravid because they're carrying around eggs and sperm at the same time, 
then it doesn't take too many individuals to to found a new population in one location and the goal then is to try to they're going to start to grow pretty quickly so you could in any one local situation you could be moving towards that runaway spread runaway cost point quickly which is unnerving so that idea the the, the distance between the point of a local establishment and then when you detect it is called a detection lag um, they're very hard to measure in reality so you know sometimes you can get a feeling for that for forest insects by especially wood boring forest insects by looking at tree cores um, and what we often see for example with emerald ash borer is from when they first showed up around the Detroit area it took about 10 years before we had a first detection and for Asian longhorn beetle it's probably five to seven years we've seen like in South Carolina from what kind of data we have so those detection lags can be pretty long so we want to minimize those as possible. And that's what I just showed you in that last graph. So of course the problem is, <laughs> and responding to invasive species in general is that it's very difficult to find them, especially when they're very rare. So finding those one or two, three, four, 10, whatever, initial individuals that found a local population is very, very difficult. And every time you have a survey tool that fails to find evidence of that presence of that insect when it was really there, so you miss, you basically have a lost opportunity. And if you have a species that's gonna move from that initial introduction towards that runaway spread uh, point quickly, then that's a huge lost opportunity. So we really wanna do everything we can to avoid that. So, you know, that's a kind of way of summarizing it and some nice um, indications of that this is a common problem across all invasive species, but certainly this is not a new observation, right? So. We've been trying to figure out how to lower that detection threshold for forever. Um, so what are we bringing to this that's new? And I would say um, we're bringing two things that are new and I kind of want to talk about each of them because they're going to kind of go together in the example that I'll show you from New York State. One are the risk maps, which Matt just did a great job of explaining. I just did a screenshot of one, screenshot of one of his apps. Uh, this is just a risk map, pathway risk map for Virginia. Um, which shows kind of hot spots of where you would expect through these human mediated transport mechanisms, um, that's where you should go and survey. So I think those, you know, the progression in risk maps for, for spotted lanternfly, but for a whole bunch of invasive species just, just gone through the roof with our ability to deal with large amounts of data, to make inferences from that data, the availability of human transport vector data, it's just really transform our ability to kind of map out what that risk looks like. And those are becoming increasingly common and very, very helpful. On the same end, especially the folks who've been kind of watching us as we have been thinking about and developing eDNA tools for insect pest management, you have just these, this sort of burgeoning. So eDNA within pest, insect pest management is rather new, but of course in, in aquatic invasive species, it's it's pretty much uh, standard practice at this point. So um, we've been trying to port over some of that experience from those other areas into thinking about invasive insect pests. So it's just a molecular tool that allows you to find the DNA that's left behind by your target insect. So you have the ability to do sight unseen um, detections and finding DNA, it turns out is even really trace amounts of DA, DNA is a lot easier than finding them visually or in a trap. So the two things to me are sort of just ready to hitch together, right? So what can we do if we hitch them together? So if we can identify in space where these risky places are, then when e with eDNA, we can target those spaces, uh, those risky places and find um, evidence that that insect passes there, even when they're very, very rare and you might not be visually getting any or even any trap data yet. So that, moves us really effectively down to not only down that we really lessen those detection lags but we do it in a smart way so that we don't imagine that we have to do this all over the state of virginia we have to do it in some very key places in virginia so by coupling those two things together i think we can get at some very powerful advances in, in solving this detection problem detection lag problem so, you know, if you're still feeling like um, you're happy from Thanksgiving, then you can kind of be romantic and think of the two things of risk maps and eDNA is like peas and carrots. But if you're just hungry because it's getting close to lunch, 
It's just peanut butter cups. Uh, two great tastes that taste great together. So what can we what can we do when we move the two together? So as an example of how we're trying to do this, um, I'll talk about what we've been doing with New York State DOT. And they had us um, <clears throat> come in and, and conduct some eDNA roadside surveys based on their risk maps. So I'll tell you a lot more about eDNA, but what the tool we're using for this particular one, this particular effort is useful on trees. And this is what we call roller aggregation. We literally use paint rollers to sort of pick up the DNA. Again, I'll, I'll explain how all that works in a second. Um, in the past, for example, we've done work on eDNA in vineyards and that's a slightly different field tool, but the lab part is all the same. So when we, I'm gonna, I've shown this map from September of 2021, sorry, September 21st of 2022, because this is a bit delayed because it's the official map, but this is kind of where we thought spotted lantern fly were in New York. And when I show you how we laid out our, our sampling, this hopefully this makes sense. So you have to kind of go back and remember that this is kind of where we thought we were in September. So this is the risk map that the uh, that New York State has produced um, where, and it's a little fuzzy, I apologize for that, but you can see the, the the risk potential going from very low in blue up to very high in red and yellow, of course, being in the in the middle. And because we have from uh, we've learned pretty well now that that spot lantern fly move pretty easily on cars and trucks. Um, to our you know probably each of our dismay, thinking even about how we might be moving things around. Um, what they found was that their riskiest places for along roadsides, especially when there are a lot of Melanthus trees or other host trees around. And then I would argue, ar also argue that there's a clear sort of signal in their risk maps associated with where cars and trucks stop for a little while and lantern flies can jump off if they happen to be hitching a ride. So we took their risk maps and came up with four transects that we were going to do eDNA surveys on, which are literally just roadside, stop the car, get out, and do a do a eDNA survey. We structured these. You can see these are our four transects. They, they kind of move out along Long Island. They move from the 8784 interchange up to Albany. They move from Binghamton up to Syracuse and Binghamton out towards Bath. We chose the beginning of each one of these to be a, a spot where the where New York State knew that they had spotted lanternflies. So we kind of anchored in the bottom of each one of these where we know they were. So we could hopefully, the idea was that um, we should get positive eDNA hits where we know that they exist. And then what we hoped to do was then move out from there and along a gradient of possible um, SLF densities into places where they didn't think they were, but they were clearly marked as high risk. So we tried to make sure some of our sites overlapped their red areas on the map and then overlapped some spots that weren't red. Uh, each of these were about 100 mile transects. Each of the dots is about 10 miles apart. They weren't exactly 10 miles apart because we were concentrating on hitting um, rest areas and uh, what cell phone stops and truck inspection stations and um, exits that had like big truck stops. Um, and then every once in a while, we just pull off on the side of the road, but we also try to pull off on the side of the road in a place where we weren't going to die from being along the side of the road, especially, especially when you get up that corridor going up to Albany, because there's a lot of really, it's the throughway. If you've ever driven, there's a lot of agro drivers that are coming up from New York, trying to get to the Catskills on time. So we tried to stop places where we could get well off the road. Um, so this is how it works, is that SLF leave a lot of eDNA evidence around, our DNA evidence around. They produce copious amounts of honeydew, which are rich with their DNA, especially as adults. They congregate around a few trees, and they do that at a particular time of year, which means that we know when you stop the truck and go out and survey, you know where to go. You go to Atlantis trees, you go to red maple trees, you go to black walnut trees, you don't go to a random tree. And they also prefer edge habitats. So again, it makes it pretty easy. So when you're doing these sort of roadside surveys, the, the pest insect actually likes the trees that are easy for us to get to. And so we are not randomly go out, going out every time we stop the truck to sort of survey for, 
for eDNA from some solid lanternflies, we kind of know where to look. And in those places where we look, we know that they deposit a fair amount of DNA. I'll say that the picture on the right, you know, I, I put that on there so you could see sort of the honeydew. Um, we would never do a, a eDNA survey in this situation because you don't need DNA to tell you there's spotted lanternflies. But what we've shown, shown in um, vineyards is that the plant material will kind of retain what we've been calling a molecular memory of, of spotted lanternfly being there for up to two days, but not much longer than that. Um, even if it's, and we can pick that up, we can pick up that signal, even if it's just one spotted lanternfly moving around a segment of tree or, or vineyards uh, for an hour and then it left. So they, they just leave lots of evidence around it. It's pretty easy for us to find. What we do for trees is we literally take paint rollers that you get at the Home Depot <laughs> and the, the, um, we sterilize them before they go out so we know there's no other DNA on them. You take them out, again, sterile. You just uh, roll them across the tree. They basically function like gigantic forensic swabs. So they move the DNA that's on the tree onto the roller and then we process that roller and find the DNA from that. So this allows sort of sight unseen detection. And we can detect again at very, very, very small amounts of DNA. Now, because we can detect very, very, very small amounts of DNA, you have to be incredibly careful about contamination between sites or even between trees when you stop if you're worried about doing one tree to the other. So we're always sort of fighting contamination in terms of making sure things are sterile. And then we're always checking for contamination. So there are checks along the way, checks in the field, checks at the end of the day, checks at the beginning of the day, checks in the lab, so that if we do see any contamination, we can pinpoint exactly where it was. So this is key if anybody uh, ends up adopting any kind of um, eDNA survey, is it whoever you have doing it for you needs to make sure they have these checks in place um, because they're critical because otherwise you'll get a sort of bad inference from your, from your methods. The last thing I'll point out here is that this is the extent of the field part. It's not, you know, it's, this is not really high tech. Um, what you do once you have the, the rollers is you put them in a sterile bag, you put DI water in there. You kind of clean them off kind of the same way you would clean off your paint roller when you were done for the day. And that DNA then gets, and, in, and a lot of other stuff gets suspended in that water. And then you filter that water through a standard of, you know, what's been used for aquatic eDNA for a long time, a filter, and that captures the DNA. And then you put the, the filter in a little tube and take it back to the lab. So the only thing you're taking back to the lab in the end is a bunch of used up dirty um, um, paint rollers, but the, the gold, if you will, is, is on those filters. And so those, those are easy to pack and move and keep pretty sterile. So here's the results of our, we did one round this year. This was in September and October, no, October. Um, we, every time we stopped the truck, we took two um, samples. So the results here say, you know, red is that two out of those two samples where each sample is three trees, rolled three trees, uh, showed positive hits for eDNA. The yellow is we only had one of the two samples test positive and green being that none of them did. Um, and as you can see, we, and then the little, um, uh, little looking glass, the little, oh, I forget what they're called, uh, glasses indicate where we also got visual surveys because we, before we did any eDNA, we did a standardized visual survey at that same location. So the only places that we got visual detections were those three spots that have the little glass. And then everywhere else you can see where we got positive um, eDNA hits. So in the end, we got 42 out of 46 of our sites where we stopped the truck and sample became, were positive for SLF DNA, where only three of those 46 also had visual detections. We had no signs of contamination either in the lab or in the field, which is very good news. And then another useful statistic is this was about two weeks and two staff and a lot of driving to do the field part and about two weeks of lab work and two staff members to process all the filters went through back in the lab to see if they had SLF DNA. There are so many things to talk about with this, this um, map. I think the way I have it um, plotted here is according to the state's SLF surveys in December. So after the, they have been doing a lot of um, visual and other surveys all through the adult, you know, the time of year when the adults are around. 
And it's a little bit of a confirmation to be sure that our results weren't crazy. Um, and so one thing you'll see is that that drive, that kind of hectic drive up from the 84, 87 interchange to Albany was just completely, there's, there's SOF in all of our eDNA samples. And in fact, uh, all the traps and everything that they had been running during that same period in the fall also showed lots of spotted lanternfly. But we only got one visual detection down at the bottom of that, which is a truck stop right at that 87, 84 interchange. So at least for our visual surveys, the eDNA performed obviously a lot better. But if you have densities of traps and because they have a big monitoring program going on, then we were consistent with what they found. Same for Long Island. Um, we had two visual detections there in our surveys. And then interestingly, when you get all the way out to the end of Long Island, that's about where we stopped right on the side of the road in front of some of the big vineyards there. And some of those had fewer detections or nothing. I would assume that's because of, um, because of localized spraying, because we were literally right on top of some of those vineyards. Um, same basic story going from Bath up to Binghamton, but I'll note that there was a part of that route where they were getting some sightings from the state, but they hadn't really gotten a ton of them. But our SLF information would suggest that they are very, very clearly already established in that area. And then going from Bath out west, it's a little bit more patchy. Um, but it's still, you can see, I think that's probably the more interesting route where you see some places where we're not getting spotted lantern flies and some places where we are. And certainly we're getting spotted lantern fly DNA hits well past where the um, state had been getting any kind of other detections, be those traps or visuals. So take home messages from year one is clearly you know, we wanted to be at the edge of where they thought that the spotted lantern flies were, so we get some gradient, and there was really no gradient. So we weren't really surveying at the front of that um, gradient. We'll try again in the summer and fall of 2023 and work with our working group at this in New York State to try to identify where that is and probably even go further than what we would think. So we'll move further out, probably further out west and a bit north. Um, can we identify new satellite populations and do these coincide with the mapped at risk locations? Well, we got so few non-detections that there's no just there's no way to do any statistics. So stay tuned and we'll hopefully be able to fine tune that. I guess this is another piece of evidence that visual surveys have very poor detection power. We probably can compare, com, uh, compare some of our results to the trapping results from the state, but we haven't done that yet. And then I think it's sort of, this is, a, this is our first chance uh, on a broad, broad scale to really see what the operational use of eDNA looks like. How hard is it? What is it? You know, how fast can we do it? What kind of results we can get? And I, I, it was encouraging in the sense that it's a pretty cost efficient way to survey over large areas in a short period of time. And while at the same time having really high sort of per sample detection rates, at least for SLF, which I said, leave very, a lot of eDNA. So um, bigger picture, what's the value of eDNA and SLF management, which is something we'll talk about a bit later, but I would suggest that expanding this um, approach out where you're kind of marrying those, the, the risk mapping, which I think is you know, beautiful to early detection um, can move us from playing catch up towards pre-planning and some more on the ground actions that might be more effective at slowing that spread. So, um, you know, basically that means finding those locations and from what maps work would suggest that's a lot of rail lines, that's more um, transportation issues, maybe airports, but looking at it as less, maybe not so much, but that you're going, that we're sort of strategically deploying the uh, eDNA surveys there and, and really well out ahead of where we think that front is because if New York, New York State's results are right, then we don't, we're, we're kind of, um, misestimating, I think, where that that um, front edge is. And then I'll also, you know, big, big picture is that, of course, there's never a single tool that solves any given invasive species issue. The task will always be one of choosing what works best given the context. So that's true for eDNA as well. So there's operational limits, there's habitat affinities, there's species life history, there's, you know, is it worth it given the impacts? Certainly there's regulations. And that varies. So the more we have expanded out from SLF to other insect species or aquatic invasive species, it's really kind of different. 
the role of eDNA is different in every one of those, depending on what those categories are. I'll also say that across the board, including in, in aquatic invasive species, in terms of a regulatory action, you really can't use, no one's really prepared at the moment to use eDNA as a trigger for regulatory actions. What it does do is allow um, concentrated um, visual and other surveys like, you know, get, get the, a critter in hand type surveys to be focused and go, go to those areas. Because if you can find critter in hand, then you can in, enforce and move into chemical uh, control and other things that you can't do. We're just not there yet in terms of eDNA results. Um, and then finally, there's a lot of other tools that are emerging, not necessarily out of my lab, but for others for eDNA, including assessing the um, success of releasing biocontrol agents, which is happening for Hemlock Bully Adelgid out of Mark Whitaker's lab at Cornell. There's port and onshore inspections, which are mostly actually happening out of Australia, although we've been working with USC APHIS on that for food commodity insect inspections. Uh, and then aquatic invasive species world, eDNA is used pretty regularly to confirm eradication success. So you don't declare success and go home and then the invasive species population rebounds. And like a lot of others, so the eDNA part is, is changing. The landscape of that is changing fast. And thankfully, from our point of view, from the pest insect stuff, is we can learn a lot from both other countries and for aquatic invasive species and other uses like that. So there's a whole lot of people associated with this who have helped in all different phases of this. I just want to recognize who those folks are and who the uh, funding agencies are. So with that, I'll, I'll stop sharing and, and see if I can answer some questions, but thank you. All right. Thanks, Julia, it was great. Um, the one question I saw came up twice was, um, how do you sterilize the paint rollers? We, we put a, well, we rinse them. Well, it depends on whether or not we're reusing them from the last time or we just pulled them out of the bag from Home Depot. But um, if we're reusing them, we rinse them with bleach and then we rinse them again and then we rinse them again and then we rinse them again and then you uh, dry them out. But we also put them under UV, a UV light to, de to decontaminate them or sterilize them. Then you immediately put them into a sterile bag and close them up. Okay. And you may or may not know the answer to this one, but do you know, is New York considering a positive eDNA hit enough to consider the county as positive for SLF? I don't think that they have decided that yet. That's a good question. Greg, actually, I think that's our talk after the break. Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, can spotter landfly DNA come from another source other than the insect? That's a great question. Uh, probably so. So anything that's eating them that might be, you know, excreting them, if there's a bird or something like that, that's possible. I will say, you know, that's why we treat uh, low concentration DNA or just one site as kind of a caution, a yellow, um, because that we would expect that to be in very low concentrations. And anything where we're getting a lot, a lot of DNA basically in our certain in our samples, or it's kind of, you know either in any one sample, there's a lot of it, or there's a lot of it around, uh, that's, that's going to be a sign that they're, it's them, it's really is them. In a way, it doesn't matter, because it, it sort of, you know, it means that they're there, uh, even because something ate it. <laughs> but, yeah. but I do see the point. Okay, and then uh, can you, um, uh, can eDNA be used for NIMP stages, or is it limited to adult detection? That's a great question. So we've worked with Tracy Lesky's group to start to start to get at that. I don't, it was right during the pandemic. And so it kind of got shortchanged. It's worth another look, but I would say our preliminary results would suggest that it's harder to find them um, when they're in nymph, nymph stages because they're smaller, which means that they're excreting less just period because of body size. But they also um, are a little more spread out along the landscape, they don't, you know, one of the nice things about adults is they do congregate on known locations and they leave their DNA there for us. And that may or may not be the same for the, the larvae, the larval stages. So there's more to explore there. Okay, I'll just do one more then. Uh, can you comment on the, and if this is too large, then you could just answer it off offline. 
Can you comment on the reliability, accuracy of eDNA detection, risk of false positives, or any risk of confusion with DNA from other plant hoppers or related species? Yeah, sure. So the best management or the best practices for developing any eDNA assay across the board is that you always do what are called specificity tests. So you test against a whole lot of different species from the very beginning. That's part of the um, standard practice and peer review. You, you get checked on it. And we did that when we originally developed this. So we tested against a whole bunch of different plant hoppers. Um, and then since then, we've had incidental ways of testing, and it's always shown to be um, specific only to lanternfly. I will say that it is always, always best practice, especially with an um, spreading invasive species to continue that process. So for example, if eDNA was to be used in California, you would wanna do that again because there's different um, co-occurring species in California than they are in New Jersey and New York, which is where we, we developed this. So it's, that's a constant process and you should always be looking, but, and, uh, and you should always be critical of that when you read an eDNA sort of thing. But I'd say in this case, we tested everything out for New York and New Jersey, and it seems to be very species specific. And what was it? Oh, false positives. Uh, that's why we do all those checks. I mean, we're very um, OCD about what we're doing because of that possibility of contamination. A lot of gloves, a lot of protocols, and a lot of checks where we do, we make sure. So if one of our the checks, if they show um, in lab that there's a eDNA, then we know where that contamination happened and we can go back and we can fix it. But if you're reading other eDNA or looking at other eDNA results, you should immediately look to see whether or not what are called negative controls are negative. Because if they aren't, then they have a contamination problem. And if they are, then it's okay. Um, but that's like a, you know, it's a point where you, you kind of need to be a savvy user of uh, reader of those things. 